Hi there. Hi there. My name is Lena Walters, and thank you all for joining us on today's webinar with Douglas Brooks. Um, Douglas Brooks is the Director of Programming and Education for BOSU, Real Rider, Indoor Cycling, and Core FX. Uh, also a former Ironman triathlete, um, he is also the author of numerous fitness education books and most recently was a recipient of, idea, of the IDEA Personal Trainer of the Year Award. So without further ado, Douglas, the floor is yours. Thanks, Lena. Appreciate the introduction and, and welcome everybody. I'm really excited to, to be here today sharing with you guys the CoreFX Conditioning Specialist Certification. It's, it's grounded uh, in movement foundation using a variety of tools, but just because we, we say the word movement foundation, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's, it's fundamental in the sense of easy or been there before. I think it's a really innovative workshop, and it's a compilation of how I train our high-level national athletes at Sugar Bowl Ski Academy, how we train our entry-level athletes who might be a 7th or 8th grader, 12, 13 years old, who, who they don't move well yet. They might be athletic, they might not be. And then working with personal training or small group or group fitness participants, we have a whole range of frail elderly to, we joke about, the Rambo Ramboette fitness enthusiasts. And we have all kinds of different needs. So. When Lena introduced me, she mentioned I was director of BOSU programming. I am also one of the directors having a cycling background uh, for education for real rider. But what the Core FX Conditioning Specialist certification does is, is bring together a variety of methodologies first. We place the science, then we look to the tools we have out there, like a Core FX wall ball or looking at a cycle, would you use a cycle in your conditioning, or looking at unstable surfaces, so would you use a BOSU dome side up, understanding what these products can and cannot accomplish based first on setting a goal, then looking to the tools around us to solve the programming challenges and puzzles, rather than coming in with a garage sale of equipment and say, I have all this quote unquote stuff and I've got to use it. That's, that's a mixed up approach. It's not correct. So I have to set my goals first, understand what a complete workout is, periodize that through the year so you cycle your volume and your intensity because not every workout can be complete, but over a year we should hit all the foundations, the fundamentals, and then be able to scale it, progression, regression, to entry level, frail elderly, special need, and also simultaneously challenge and keep on track world-class athletes. So that's, that's where we're going with the core effects conditioning specialist is putting this all together from a 30, 40,000 foot view so that you can create programming that is personalized and individual and scalable. And a lot of times, you know, I'll go in and, and do, for instance, a, a BOSU session that uses the BOSU for, for an hour. Or we'll go in and ride real rider cycling for an hour because those are typical formats. So yeah, sometimes individual products can stand alone. And especially in group fitness and the typical club model, we tend to use these products for a lot of the duration unless we evolve into small group or, or boot camp. But generally when I'm training, I often will use a tool to help solve the programming challenge for five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten minutes of the workout. So it's part of a complex. And then there's a through line of these complexes or groups of exercises. So what CoreFX Conditioning Specialist training does is give you the construct to organize your planning so that you your workouts don't feel the same. So I'm going to flip through a couple slides that I've pulled from the conditioning specialist, hopefully to further pique your interest, get you excited about this, because it isn't the same. This is really new and different based on a methodology that's time tested, it's evidence, science based. And currently, I have this amazing, if you want to call it a laboratory, at least I have guinea pigs, right? With ages of all athletes, men and women, girls and boys, and then I'm testing this all the time to see what sticks, 
what happens with regard to getting results for the average person versus the high-level athlete, injury prevention, skill progression. And at the end of the day, all of this as it relates to compliance and motivation has to work too because our people have to have fun. doesn't mean they're not going to work hard. doesn't mean they're not going to be challenged, but it also has to be fun. So when, when, you, when we come into the workshop, a lot of times, Times, sure, we're going to review the goals, what the expectation is that we're trying to, to accomplish, and, and I just really reviewed that in terms of what this core FX conditioning specialist credential means. It is going to be a great way to organize your training, to set the goal, to create a communication and uh, a two-way street of what's going on in your program, what do you want to accomplish, and have a construct, like I said earlier, to be able to accomplish this. So the goals of this particular certification, one, we want to leave with you quote unquote owning it, meaning you own the skill sets that we teach. And there are going to be a variety of movement skills that you're going to do teachbacks, you're going to get to practice, we're going to break down the coaching cues and the teaching progressions and the complexes, how we group and organize these skills so they make sense. One of the things that our industry is getting a little bit of heat, a little bit of criticism about is that we're doing a lot of these high intensity interval training Tabata metabolic type workouts. Nothing wrong with that because we actually have a subset of that, understanding how and when to use it in this workshop. But if your movement skills aren't developed and we blow the whistle and go, a lot of times you just almost want to blow the whistle and stop and go, we need to go back to foundation here. We need to stop that medial knee collapse, that release into the low back, dumping stress and force and shear through the spine. We've got to get the head position. We've got to know how to set the scapular area of the upper back. So underneath, before we blow the whistle and maybe do a metabolic workout, we want to make sure the skill foundation is there and that we really, really focus on coaching these skills. So that's a big part of what we do. Also, we need to be able to execute these skills and give a good demonstration of what it should look like. And if you can't demonstrate it well, you need to find someone who can help you do that well. It could be one of your athletes. You don't have to be the master of everything, but you need to facilitate this correct execution and demonstration. And then earlier, the idea of what I said is a construct, how to organize your exercises and how to use your equipment so that you can construct a training session and a through line of training sessions over a year that makes sense and help you to accomplish the goals and the progressions of your athletes and your participants. So in the trenches at some point is so valuable because many times we talk theoretically and you need to be able to take top shelf science in theory and ideas down to an application level. I really feel like when you move this certification, when you leave this certification, it will affect, it will impact, and it might actually to a great degree change how you train because it is so user friendly at the end of the day that you will, that next week, start to implement some of these ideas that we'll be talking about. The other part about teaching effectively goes back to the compliance and the fun and obviously results. The other day I asked one of my, my older clients that I work with in his 80s, what's, what's fun about training? And I expected him to say, well, I learn, I, 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 I get better, uh, social, uh, background music for motivation, my peers, culture, community, which we need to evolve. But he looked me right in the eye and he said, you know what's fun, Douglas? Results. So, that can take you a long way as people are accomplishing their acute goals, what they want to happen right now, some midterm goals, and maybe those long-term, long-reach goals. Is it lose 100 pounds? Is it get on the national ski team, be an Olympian or an ex-gamer? So we need to also have in the background noise of all this planning and tech and science the idea of creating community and culture where it moves from being coach, instructor, centric. We're always important, but almost the athletes and the groups of people working together become dependent on one another 
for motivation, encouragement, and to some degree, as we teach, they can also keep an eye on in terms of movement execution. So we definitely want to look at being able to create a, a cohesive environment that elevates everybody. So we're going to look at those, uh, look at all those kind of modalities. So w as you come into this workshop, you'll get all of our Core FX certification training materials, which includes a detailed uh, workbook that you'll work through. <clears throat> the corefx.ca website is also good. You can look at our blogs and look at the various resources that, that you have there. So again, very, very excited uh, to, to have you with that. I'm going to go back one, one, more, one more slide here. I talked a lot about a moment ago the importance of evolving and developing the instructor, the coach. So when we go through leadership and coaching development and growth related to that, we want you to always be thinking about when you're teaching, when you're coaching, your skill level. So what's your technical ability to articulate verbally and to simultaneously demonstrate skill progressions? A lot of my athletes, jokingly, they, they think for an old guy that I'm really, really strong. But I always tell them, you, you don't get it. You, you're going through sometimes an hour, hour and a half. Maybe it's even a three-hour training block. Who knows? And I only do one or two reps. And you guys are doing the whole workout, and you're doing a whole set, and you're also doing it under load. But the point was, then they started laughing, and they go, oh, that's how you work that. But the point is, I can do a few reps really well, so I can create that visual, create the linking of timing and rhythm, the sequence, ground-based, core connect, kind of express that movement through the arms, block, rotate, keep the hands back, whatever it is, if it's a kicking, hitting, striking skill. So these movement foundations are going to be huge, and you need to be able to effectively demonstrate them. How do you do that? Saddle time. You practice over and over again. You work with each other. You record and videotape yourself, which will do a little bit of that in the teach back. Because what we do takes a lot of an investment. And then along with being able to articulate the skill, that ties right into the communication aspect that we want to be aware of and develop. So it could be something you say, so it's verbal, or it could be a nonverbal communication in terms of a demonstration, or even communicating and motivating could be you connect with someone's eyes during the workout, give that little chest pump saying you're killing it without even having said a word. So we need to definitely connect, get down on that level with the participant and everybody, athlete, participant, personal training client, connect with them at least once on a personal level, whether it's a pat on the back, whether it's an eye contact, whether it's verbal instruction. So we really, really work hard on that. Then when you look at the overall construct of the workout, how do you build and sustain a through line in a program that has everything that you need? And again, every workout can't have every element of functional training or coordination or agility or reactivity or high level strength or power development or plyo effect, uh, even though they should all have safety and so on you're not necessarily going to have those in every workout. But over the year, you want to touch all those elemental foundations. That's going to be critical. So you do have to have a through line from session to session that culminates in a through line for weeks, months, and even a year planning program. And then with your content, we want to be able to look at progression and regression and be able to make adjustments on the spot and in, intent, and in anticipation of the skill level, the capability of the individual or small group that you'll be working with. So the ability to adjust variables, to take a foundational movement skill to back it up or to elevate it with movement speed, with loading, with neural complexity, whatever it be, instantly uh, are all very, very important. And then the idea of leadership. You know who you would follow and who you would work hard for. I know as a cycling coach, as a ski coach, the best thing an athlete can ever tell me or a client is this is kind of a metaphor, I will ride for you. That means they respect you, they will ride, they will work for you, 
they will give all. So it's not literally cycling, but it means I will work for you because I trust you, I respect you, I appreciate what you put into this in terms of planning. You listen, you communicate, you challenge me, you motivate me. And the expectation of a high-level athlete is to work hard and to benefit from that development. And that's, I think, the mindset, developing athletes in everybody that we should have. So that'll be a big part of what we do uh, in the workshop, knowing that we can't always just focus on and lifting. We need to focus on the development of, of the whole. So the overview of where we're going on this is athleticism is our focus. It's the umbrella over really all of fitness and, and really movement. So athleticism really is about rhythm and timing and sequential movement. The irony of great athletes, whether you're 80 or whether you're 20, is you do something as it relates to movement that is pretty challenging, hard, and complex, and you make it look easy. Everybody wants to move like that. So when we look at, if I were to ask you guys, uh, if you define the word agility, you'd have a couple things that come right to mind. Some of you might say quickness, direction change, anaerobic capability, multiplanar movement, and so on. Exactly. All of those things are right and everything else you're thinking about. So agility really is the ability to move well. It's a host of desirable athletic traits that you want to develop in everybody. You, you might have also thought about balance and power. And let, let's just stop real quickly because I train my 80-year-old the same way as I train my 20. I scale it though. So does an older adult need power? And if I ask you how do you develop power, what is power? You'd say it's an element of strength and speed. So it's force speed is an expression of power. Now one RM or one rep max power, maybe an older adult doesn't necessarily need that, say an Olympic lift, the most amount of weight they can lift once. That's maximal power expression. But if an older adult stumbled, regained their center of gravity over their base of support, avoided a fall, which could be catastrophic at older ages, did that require a power expression? Absolutely. They have to react right now with very little or no conscious thought because if they think about it, they are going to fall. So we have to keep our older adults sharp, just like our high-level competitive athletes. So this idea of developing agility, a host of desirable athletic traits, developing athleticism, which encompasses that, taking our training from primary, which I'll talk about in a moment, to secondary. Secondary training starts to look like functional training. What's functional training? I know people are tired of that term. But relatively, functional training is simply training that transfers well to activities of daily life and sport. So I always paint a continuum. And if you just held up your left hand and said, OK, over here is isolation. In the middle of that continuum is high transfer training. And then way over on the right is specificity. That's life, that's sport. So Isolation isn't worthless, but at some point we need to transfer and evolve our training to be integrated. And, and I'll show this slide quickly later. CARBS equal P, an acronym with a bunch of S's. C-A-R-B, S-S-S-S, equal P. Coordination, agility, reactivity, strength, speed, safety, equals power expression. That to me, power expression, with many of those elements that also include stability, mobility, and so on, need to be developed to move our training from primary to secondary or, let's say, functional, or even a better word I like, or two words, is high transfer. And then there's a point. I move from isolation. I move to secondary, which is more functional. It transfers better to what I do as it relates to movement in real life. And then there's a point, no matter what I do in the training room, I've got to eventually go ski on snow, kick a soccer ball, or 
play softball, whatever it is. And then we see how much of that high transfer training transfers to the specific skills of the sport or activity. So we can also have a fitness approach where it's burning calories, it's feeling better, it's moving better. You're able to pick up your grandchild without hurting yourself and engage 24-7 with high energy. So this program works really, really well that way. And again, so scalable regardless of the direction that you're moving. So when we look at the foundation of what we'll go through in our skill blocks, we'll work on dynamic warm-ups that could include mobility and stability. We'll work on rotation, multiplanar movement, balance, integrated uh, type movement, and whole body coordination. We want to get those skills and drills, as you see them come up on your PowerPoint, the transfer to real life and sport. We want to be able to scale our movement progressions from professional athlete to fitness enthusiast to high need participant. We want to create an environment, again, that engages, motivates, creates culture, community. So we're going to find that right mix of maybe you have opportunity to work one-on-one. -on -one. Can you work small group and partner challenges? Uh, those of you who teach group fitness only, you can take this methodology and make it work even for that. But we want to make it engaging, fun, and complete in terms of hitting all those components of movement that we need to develop over time. We also will literally experience a number of workouts and blocks, how I would develop them, so that you can take the theory and put it into application and go, oh, this is how you sequence it. This is why we're using this equipment. This is, this is why we're highlighting this particular movement skill. So it's kind of that idea. We want to build these fitness warriors and these athletes from the ground up literally and they believe in their bodies and when they ask their body to respond, the body will react. No question, the confidence would be there. So again, these are some of the psychological things as well as the mental, the mindset. And then yeah, then you gotta have the tools. You gotta be able to execute these drills you need to be able how to teach progression and regression. So the whole mental mindset thing is, is going to be huge. And yeah, it's my belief everybody should want to train and move like an athlete. And the reality is everybody really does. They just don't know that they can. So we got to give them the right tools for that. So sometimes you see this question come up or you see a statement. Somebody says, training is my sport. I kind of like that in a way, because I know what they're saying. They say they love training so much it's become their sport, or maybe it's like CrossFit or the Spartan races. That almost can become your sport. But I don't love the idea that I just go in to the weight room, to the training room, to the functional training area, to a group fitness class, to Pilates, yoga, whatever it is, just to train, train, train. Because a lot of people have been training for 20 years and they're stale and they need to create a sense of occasion around their training, a culmination, a measurement of what they're doing and why they're doing it. So many of you who are runners, you run, 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 run. I'm a runner. I used to run six marathons a year, did Kona Ironman. I'm not saying it was smart, but yeah. And so I'm not against endurance at all. Endurance is great. And you get all these things in our industry about, oh, you shouldn't run, you should only sprint. And there's always a middle ground, and you need to justify it with a reason that ties to the training goal. But the idea is if, if you're a runner at some point, you go, okay, I'm running, I'm running, I'm running, I'm running. I want to I want to measure myself. I'm going to enter into a 5K. And then you do that and you go, wow, that was cool. And then it's a 10K. And then you get really silly and you enter into a marathon. So here's my point. I train not because it's my sport, because I want it to reflect well on what I do in real life. I train for engaging with my grandchildren, though I don't have any. That's a good thing, but you get what I mean. I train so that I can engage in the things I love to do in life. And then there's an outcome, and then there's a motivation, and there's a measurement for that. So just a little different mindset. We, we train for life and the expression of what we do as it relates to the movement requirements, whether, again, you're someone whose dream is to be on the national U.S. ski team and go to the Olympics, or an older adult who is trying to regain their physical independence. They're chair-bound right now. 
and they want to be able to be mobile. Those are world-class goals right there that everybody should strive for. So the other thing that we talk about is silliness. You know, what is effective training? And you can look at these pictures and have a, a reaction. I, I, I tend not to go way to the right or left. I try to create an understanding of where would somebody be coming from who's standing on a stability ball with 135 pounds on their back. Um, you know, is that kettlebell drive overhead on a balance board effective? Uh, there's a circus kind of going on of movement activity on a functional training gym. Not necessarily negative. Um, then I see a little functional training space that has some turf and so on. So the idea is that we want to have purpose behind our training. We can all go on YouTube, pick out five crazy exercises, keep our clients or groups busy for an hour, and at the end of the day, they might have fun, actually get some fitness result, but it's not as good as it could be in terms of a through line and putting purpose and intent behind the training. That's the variety for sake of variety that we need to really look at. That's not really acceptable. And then we need to look at risk reward. Even uh, going back to me being one of the directors for BOSU programming, you know, my background is science, exercise physiology. I know science. But there, there's a lot of even controversy around training on unstable surface. It's not so much BOSU, it's labile surfaces. So there's some research out there that was done using some of the pillows, and which are very unstable, that, that indicates from a high performance standpoint that you shouldn't really be training on unstable surfaces as it relates to maximal loading and power. Or say a bilateral stance like a squat, that's hard to do effectively on unstable surface and personally for me you don't even need a research study to prove that. That's common sense. If I'm working heavy loading I'm trying to drive my strength gains and then add an element at some point of speed to that I'm probably going to do that on a lifting platform or a stable surface but somebody would take that study which is about high performance maximal strength and power gains underline those words and say it's stupid to train on a BOSU or unstable service. And you're saying, well, what about the 40 years of prophylactic research as it relates to injury prevention? What about the goal is often different on an unstable surface? It's submaximal loads, it's whole body integration, it's ankle, knee, hip development. There are a number of research studies that have used unstable training to prevent and have become part of the ACL injury prevention programs, especially with women, but as relevant for men. So all of a sudden, we can either go right or left based on one study. We can be a blind advocate. Oh, you should do everything on unstable surfaces. Or we can be a hater. How stupid. Why would you be on an unstable surface? Or we can go to the middle and seek understanding and make some good choices so that we get it right and give every advantage and option that we can to our participants. So, for instance, you look at this this guy standing on the stability ball. 99.99999999% of the people out there probably shouldn't do that. It's crazy. But I don't teach this, but I've seen this at the US ski team. Our athletes can mount the ball on, with 135 pounds on their back, stand up on it, and they can actually walk the ball anywhere in the room without touching down. But here's the deal. Every now and then somebody moves up. They messes up. So they fall. They risk injury a whole season for an elite athlete or whether you're a recreationalist. Is it worth it? Risk reward. But the other thing is you have to get into the mindset of high level athletes. If you told a high level athlete that for instance standing on the platform side of the BOSU which we don't recommend is dangerous, they would laugh at you. Going 80 miles an hour down a hill is dangerous. Getting 20 feet of air out of a pipe is dangerous. For them, that skill is neither here nor there. Is it valuable? Questionable, and so on. Is the risk reward relevant? Yeah, but they don't do anything safe. They ride dirt bikes, they go fast. So my point is, if we can interpret this and understand it and realize as a general recommendation, standing on a stability ball, period, probably not a good idea for most people. Standing on the platform side, especially in a group situation, on a BOSU for example, where it's really tough to monitor 
it's tough to supervise, not worth it. The manufacturer has a thing on the bottom of the platform, don't do it. So the idea is we have to use our brains a little bit and think through this, but think for yourself. Don't take someone else's single research study or opinion or blog, which isn't peer reviewed, and bias your opinion. Sometimes we get lazy. We need to do our own homework and pull together a consensus of opinion to start making these decisions about what is effective. And here's the bottom line. You need some science at the bottom of it, but you can manipulate science and statistics, take what you want in terms of study as opposed to the consensus. So we need the consensus to make our decisions. So we'll have some fun and we'll integrate that through lines throughout this training. So what is effective training? Um, I think I've, I'm going to see if I can play this video. It's just a little snippet of what we can do. If not, you can go to the corefx.ca website and look at some of the blogs and the teaching uh, video clips that we've done and so on. I'm going to see if this if this is going to play, but I, I may not be. Yeah, I, I guess I can't play it. So you guys, take take a little look at that and go to the, the website and you guys can, can watch this. But effective training comes down to, uh, let's see, maybe it's loading. Maybe I will play this. How about that? Awesome. So I don't know if you can hear this or how quickly it is loading, but you can see we're using a variety of tools. Here's a little bit of a plyo teaching progression using hurdles in the Corfex plyo box. It's all about landing, trying not to drop the hips too low, trying to protect the ACL, avoiding medial collapse, learning arm drive, moving from bilateral landings to unilateral landings. There's some power development here, not just plyo effect, so we're developing some strength and speed. And then as you develop plyo, we also realize that it's, it's about deceleration. It's about acceleration. Uh, let's see. There we are. I think you guys are, I don't know. There we are. We're back. And so uh, landing, deceleration, acceleration, arm drive, good overall movement skills. And we can regress that to a simple stationary arm drive with heel lift. It's a drive up, it's a deceleration down. My older adults can do that. Then we add complexity, height, instability possibly, uh, for ankle knee hip integration, and, and the list goes on and on. So just a, a little bit of a sneak preview of some of the things that we'll be doing. So when you look at sport and life, I'm very visual, so a lot of times I will look at pictures. I'll look at one of our skiers, Mark Engel, there on the bottom right. He's on the U.S. ski team. You look at soccer. You look at the angulation. You look at this hip block and drive, keeping the hand back, back of the baseball player. You look at physical contact required in soccer and so on. And what you realize is that everything we do in life, if we're going to create high transfer training, requires a unique blend of balance, strength, and explosive power, independent of your goals your age, or your current capability. And we have to have some aerobic capacity, but we have to be able to turn on the jets now and then. So we need anaerobic capacity. So anything we do, hitting a softball, hitting a tennis ball, avoiding a fall after a stumble, requires a quick explosive power element. So we're incorporating all of this into our training approach, and really we're basing it on a model or paradigm that is neuromuscular, so it's that brain muscle con connection and a proprioceptive type of evolved whole body integrated training where you get a sense of body control being a skill in of itself. So that's why it works so well for high level athletes. And even though we train everybody as an athlete, they have different goals in terms of absolute expression of what they're trying to accomplish. The best athlete in the world versus I would like to lose a little weight, feel better, and not have back pain. So that's why it scales really well to youth as well as just recreational adults and, and fitness enthusiasts who want to get in, on board with the, the same model. So we're going to develop the physical skills and tools to support our clients, athletes, and group fitness participants and their movement execution. Some of the things that we'll focus on with this high transfer 
let's call it functional training program, is whole body linked movement. We're going to move from that isolated model to high transfer, and then all this is going to let us go play our sport or do our activities of daily life better. We want linked whole body training that involves the core, especially as a stabilizer, linking upper to lower body. That's going to be a key movement expression. And you see a couple exercises down below that that um, you know that we can be creative and that we can replicate with many different tools or no equipment in a training environment like we're going to have in the certification training days. So the, the principle is key, understanding what you want to accomplish and then looking to how am I going to accomplish this and understanding why you're putting it in the program to make hopefully that program more complete and help the athlete, quote unquote, be able to accomplish their training goals. We want to also be able to optimize fitness results in a time efficient way. We want it to be in a fun and inspiring format and we get all of this in an approach like this. So the whole idea, why people love, I think, functional integrated whole body training, it's skill based fitness development. Anybody's going to go brain numb if you're working linear machines, there's no variability, range of motion is predetermined, it's like running indefinitely on a treadmill. At some point, I got to shake things up. Running on a treadmill is not bad unless that's the only thing you do in your program. So that's what we're looking for. I mentioned the carbs equal P, you've got it there. It's that idea of we want to move our training to functional coordination, agility, reactivity, balance, strength, speed, and safety, which is all in an expression and leads to power development. That's huge. Agility, all these key and desirable athletic traits. The umbrella over all this is athleticism. So very, very good on that. A couple other things as we go through our training that we're also in the background trying to develop is an equalized body as it relates to strength, mobility and stability. And we'll talk about which comes first, stability, mobility. Well, if, if I can position myself well, can I still maintain good alignment when I'm stationary and on the move? If I can't execute position, I can't get to where I need to be, then stability isn't that good until I can hit that joint angle or body position. So again, sometimes your Flexibility, if you want to call it that program, might involve mobility if I can't hit positions. If I can hit a position, my mobility program actually might start with stability. And so we'll talk about that. You've got to always have your eyes open. And it's not always one way all the time, but you want to definitely be open to what is current and happening. And we do that by watching our athletes, by watching our participants. And then we move this to balance bilateral and unilateral movement capability. You can hide a lot by always working bilateral. We need to have independent limb movement. We don't want to have that good side versus bad side, neutralize that. And we, we, we tend to have a side that's dominant. Most people will notice that when they rotate one way or stand on one foot. But we want to move away from that if we can, for sure. We want to train the core. We want to train the core as a stabilizer. We want to train the core to resist rotational forces. And in doing so, that often means it works as a stabilizer. I'm not someone who says you should never do a crunch. There's actually some reasoning behind that. And there's some amazing research that Brad Schoenfeld has that actually supports that. So again, you can be a crunch hater or you can be a functional training core stabilizer development zealot but the idea is we need to understand both sides. It's so easy to pull out, again, a little bit of information or somebody's rant on a blog, throwing in a little bit of research that sounds good, but if you speak the language, you know it's irrelevant. So we have to be a little careful in our thought process, and I think that's part of being professional. The idea is not to have an ego, to be a smart aleck, put somebody down, make somebody wrong. My motivation to understand working the core as a stabilizer that, that turns on and off. That's so important, but also understanding where some flexion, extension, lateral flexion might come into play so I can get it right for my participant. And again, 
give them all the options they need to create a well-rounded program that helps them move forward. So again, the idea of just jumping on the bandwagon or being lazy, not doing your homework, not looking at peer-reviewed research, getting a little sound bite and going with that because it justifies your position. Guys, remember, it's not about being right or wrong in the sense of my ego or my methodology or my way. It's get it right for your clients. That's my motivation. So also the core then is huge as a stabilizer in terms of initiating or contributing to rotational movement. Can we develop that core inside out of our activities and sports in a way that's going to have a high transfer? And, and the answer is absolutely yes. And understanding that the core is more than anterior posterior or anterior only abdominal muscles. There's a fascial systems and so on. So, you know, th there's so much information and we're going to have so much fun in, the, in this workshop. So we'll identify what the core is and what it really means. So training the core, we'll use a variety of equipment. We're not going to watch this video clip right now. Like I said, go to uh, corefx.ca and you can watch all the clips and look at our blogs and some of the educational material we're putting out there. Education, this is a big mission, message. Education comes first and the products follow if they line up with our ability to use it, that product to solve a programming challenge. And that's what you're going to see. It's just good education. And then we look to our training tools out there or even just use body weight and so on, depending on what the goal is. So obviously, we're going to look a lot at multi-planar and directional movement. So sagittal, frontal, transverse planes. Here's some of our athletes doing you know, a little jelly drill that we did outside. But um, it's so much more, this whole idea of functional training, than just directional changes and anaerobic capability and up-down and planal movements. But this is a really, really important part of it. And again, the core is, is kicking in in all of these things. We're going to look at developing balance, mobility, and stability and the combination of those that you need and when you need them in your training program. All we're doing is trying to polish off the chinks in our armor to make us more whole and complete as an athlete. So these are so foundational, balance, stability, mobility. And there is a timing based on athlete characteristic capability. And then can you, when you're on the move, maintain balance? Do you have the mobility to position and the stability to stay there during acceleration, deceleration, or perturbation type movements where someone's trying to bump you out or you slip and you still have to maintain position on a dynamic movement? And then you can't talk about functional training and just look at skill development and movement patterning without talking about energetics. So we're going to talk about specific energy systems you've got to train to support this high-level skill execution. So you bring in not only the energetics, but you also have to bring in dynamic, unstable, and unpredictable environments as well because everything we do isn't necessarily predictable. And if you're going to be able to move well with this dynamic of life, then you've got to have varying cardiorespiratory demands. So we'll look at that in terms of how do you develop anaerobic capability in an 80-year-old, in an elite athlete? Why is that so important? Is, is aerobic, predominantly aerobic training out? Absolutely not. That's the foundation for recovery from hard work. So again, sprint lover, sprint hater, aerobic lover, aerobic hater, you've got to find the middle ground. It's not that easy. Train one or the other. You've got to train them both and understand when and how to do that, what's lacking in the program to make them more complete. So when we look at load and volume, especially in strength training, intensity rules. But there's a continuum of easy to hard, light to heavy, and there's a strength and power continuum that I referred to earlier from one rep max all the way up to sustaining eight and a half, nine hours or more in an Ironman uh, to a quick reactive type movement like an older adult responding to a slip and trying to regain their center of gravity over their base of support. So loading is much more than the heavy plates you see in that picture of one of our athletes. Oh, we train heavy for sure, but we're also finding that the power development training at submaximal loads, which usually represent a more realistic expression of what we are doing in real life. Rarely do we have a 1RM max unless you're a power Olympic lifter, which is a sport. 
So we're learning some things that it, it doesn't have to be that contest of who can jump the highest or lift the most, but what it, what is able to be expressed and what is a high transfer and what is usable when I go out and do the things that I need to do. So we'll talk about all of those things. And then finally, you've got to pull together your functional training program. You've got to prepare the body to move. So within your dynamic warm-up, uh-oh, what did I just do? I lost you guys. Let's see if I can get back to you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, my whole screen went blank, but I'm back. All right. So you've got to have a dynamic warm-up, and you're preparing the body to move the nervous system. Um, it doesn't always solve positional problems. So preparation is one thing for activity, but don't forget your mobility and st stability as part of that whole foundation, and that's the, that's really the point of that. Um, that that won't always necessarily solve your positional problems. Obviously, the controlled dynamic warm-up should precede vigorous activity, and assuming that you can get optimal positioning, you're good to go. Otherwise, you need to supplement that training with mobility and soft tissue work. So part of your warm-up could inc include rolling, it can include mobility work, and so on. But the idea about perfect positioning optimizes balance, power, safety, and performance huge. So when we look at this, you want high-level performance? I want that in my 80-year-old. I want them to be safe. I want that in my 20-year-old. You're going to have to have this as one characteristic, obviously, of your overall daily program needs. So get them ready so they can accelerate, go fast, be agile, be safe. And uh, so that's going to be a component. Then this is an example of one of our complexes, groups of exercises, where we do a foundational movement skill kind of dynamic warm up with progressions. So again, we talk about theory, then we do it. We talk a little bit about theory and philosophy on how you design a workout and then we do it. You guys will have so much hands on in this certification. In fact, some, at some point you may say, could you do some more lecture? Because you're going to work definitely, but it'll be a lot of fun as we, as we learn and, and grow together. Last couple of things I want to chat about, and we'll wrap this up, and I, I believe we're going to open to a few, few questions, whatever we have time for, is that there is a framework you need, otherwise the planning process is overwhelming because you can do this, you can do this, and oh my gosh, there are so many elements that we have to look at. So this is that 30,000 foot view of, of, of training. So when you look on your right, the training outcome, whole body integrated movement model. So down, down on that very base, you need that mobility, you need stability, you need to develop those athletic qualities that represent agility, and then you're underneath that umbrella of athleticism. You need body equilibrium, the EQ. You need the carbs, coordination, agility, reactivity, balance, strength, speed, blah, 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 which is a power expression. That moves your training to functional. You get those elements of mobility and stability in there. You don't have a good side, so you equalize the training bilateral, unilateral, you move well right, left, you stand on a f right, left foot well, and agonist, antagonist. So balance, strength, and movement capability. And then this idea of physical literacy is, a, is a, an expression in, in the research community that's been around a number of years, but it's becoming big, kind of a body that's smart, that works for life and sport. So it's that high transfer training. And then a little bit of overlap when you look at the whole body integrated movement model, but then it's like within your workout, more of a micro view, you, you've got to push pull. You've got to move up down. You've got to add rotation. There's your planes. You've got to locomote, so meaning you've got to move. You've got to do this when you're on the move eventually too. And then you've got to introduce an element of neural complexity. So challenge the body with complicated complex movement as is appropriate. Then you work all your planes, sagittal, frontal, transverse, multiplanar. Then you look at lines of force, vertical, horizontal, diagonal. We need to create lines of force with tubing, cable, pulley systems, gravity. And then again, equalized, and then that all leads to that power expression, which is force times strength or speed and strength of movement. So we're tying it into a model like that. And I've kind of reviewed a, a whole lot of that, and you see it one more time here. So when you look at the ingredients, to optimize movement, performance, and safety, 
those acronyms were foundations of movement on the very bottom of that top triangle, planes of movement, lines of force, equalized body right, left, power expression, which is representative of that force times speed. At the very top of that, you have a training outcome, or basically that training outcome is peak or optimal performance. And everybody strives for that, again, independent of age or absolute capability. You might not be a world-class athlete, but you still want all that. Everybody wants that for sure. So this training hierarchy right here is that idea that earlier, primary components of fitness are your basic cardio, isolated strength endurance, static flexibility. We learn to eat well. We know about our body composition, typical health club model. Then when you move that to secondary components of fitness, you've got the carbs equal P, coordination, agility, reactivity, balance, speed, add strength there, add safety and its expression of power. As soon as you move training from primary to secondary, that's when you get into more of the functional integrated model that transfers well to everything we do in life. You see the pictures, the dynamic aspect, and in reality, that's performance. So that's where we're, we're going uh, in this workshop. You can see these pictures. These are, these are I always give family pictures. The, the guy on, on the left is Mark Engel. He's on the US ski team right now. He's a dear friend. That old guy on your right is me just getting ready to try to release that cable and do a little wake surfing. And then my son Dylan is a skier as well. He's down on the right. So again, this doesn't necessarily have to be skiing. Those are just the kind of pictures I have or, or motocross and things like that. But at the end of the day, why do I train? Do you remember when I asked you that earlier? Training is not my sport. These are my sports. Life is my sport. And how I train should interact with and influence how I do this. And you could change those pictures to be anything you want. Interaction with kids, walking, hiking, softball, tennis, golf. It's going to make that aspect of life and physical engagement better. So the question becomes, does what we do cross to life in sport? As it relates to the training room and having that high transfer at the end of the day that relates to specificity of what we do in real life. So you guys, again, if you have any questions or follow-up other than what we take at the end of the seminar, go to www.corefx.ca. Be sure you check out our blog, our educational video clips. The blogs are educational in nature as well. You'll have a lot of fun with that. Hope to see you uh, all at the CanFit Pro Toronto event. It's amazing. I, I'm thinking, I don't want to misspeak, but I think it's probably the largest in the world. We're going to be doing that CFX pre-con on Thursday, August 13th from 8.30 to 5. And if you stay through the conference as well, I've got a, a couple other additional core FX workshops. One's called Grit and Gut, and so we're going to really highlight core development. And then one is also uh, called uh, Power Play, which we're going to look at developing power to a higher degree. The workshops are independent of the certification. So if you come to one or the other, there won't be an overlap because we want you to have new skills. Thank you guys so much for listening. Exciting. Hope to see you soon in CanFit Pro uh, TO. And I think uh, CanFit will come back on, probably Lena, and uh, orchestrate the little interaction that we have time for here. Great. Thank you so much. So on behalf of CanFit Pro, I'd like to thank our presenter, Douglas Brooks, for being with us today and for providing us with an introduction to the CoreFX Conditioning Specialist Certification. Thanks for everyone who took the time out to join this webinar. If you are hoping to complete a CEC quiz relevant to this webinar, um, it will be made available via the CanFit Pro Interactive site in about uh, two to four days. A recording of this webinar will also be available on Interactive around the same time. Uh, so Douglas, right now you have about five minutes to take questions if you'd like to do so. That sounds great. How do we go about it? I'm just checking here. I'm just gonna type on here. Uh, there are no questions, so I guess uh, I would like to thank everyone for their attendance, and hopefully we'll see you at the World Fitness Expo at the World Fitness Expo in August. Looking forward to seeing you guys there, and uh, like I said, any follow-up, just go to www.corefx.ca. Uh, it's going to be a really engaging, 
hands-on experience, I think we'll wrap everything up into something that impacts how you chain, how you actually train uh, when you go back. So looking forward to seeing everybody. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you, Douglas. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank <laughs> you.